Hi, welcome to another talk regarding Activity Director Best You Can Be. This afternoon we're going to talk about sexual behaviors in nursing homes and we hope that this will be helpful to you to understand what you should do, what you shouldn't do, and how you should make it everything safe for people. So. Uh, one of the things that happens is when people have sexual behaviors, it's caused by a couple of different reasons. One, it be, can be caused by the medication that we've given them. And sometimes the medication that we give them lowers their ser serotonin inhibitors and they act out in ways that they normally would not and they would be very embarrassed if they realized they were doing this. Sometimes too, the medication that we give them also heightens their sexual desires. So we have to be careful of that, and if that medication needs to be changed, we need to look and see how we can control that for them to make their life uh, more pleasant and not having them be socially inappropriate. The other thing that happens is sometimes it's the way that we um, uh, act in our environment that is um, encouraging to people. So sometimes when we talk and we call somebody by honey sweetie instead of Mr. Jones or Miss Mary, um, we are contributing to a sense of, uh, oh, I'm really kind of interested in you. And we're coming on to them, even though we aren't really meaning to project that because of the difference in our generations that they might consider that they come on to. So we have to be very careful of that. The other thing that we have to be careful about is sometimes it's the way we dress that is encouraging people. So for gentlemen and ladies, make sure that your cracks are not being shown. So ladies, don't have anything that's too low. And gentlemen, I would encourage you not to have pants that are sliding too far down the back of your back so that your cracks are showing. And you are probably laughing, how can that be? Well, I'll tell you, I had a very handsome uh, maintenance man in my building and he had muscles. And I wanna tell you, he wore his little muscle shirts and he was showing off. And once in a while when he would bend over, his pants would slide down. And I kid you not, this happened. When he was on the hall, two of the ladies came out of their room and they say, hey, Johnny's on the floor. And the lady across, oh, Johnny's on the floor. And they all came out in their little wheelchairs and looked to see what Johnny was doing and see if he was gonna bend over or see if he was gonna tease or interact with them. Now, some of this stuff is perfectly fine and it's appropriate boy-girl interaction. But if we're misleading somebody, then it is not fine. The other thing I would warn, especially our well-endowed women, make sure that when you bend over, you're not, your blouse isn't too loose, that you're exposing more than what you should. That would be misleading to a gentleman who might be in that viewing area. So be careful of how you dress. Be careful of how you talk. And also we want to be careful of the medication that we give people, because these are all triggers that can lead somebody astray, a miscommunication that can cause um, some sexual interaction. Um, the other things that sometimes will cause people to act out sexually, and that is if they are feeling a sense of loss or a sense of lack of control or frustration. And sometimes people will act out sexually or be a little bit more aggressive with their sexual um, interest or behaviors. Another time when you will see a person sort of act out sexually is uh, when they're facing their own mortality and they have a grasping for life and uh, grasping for getting as much pleasure as they can out of life and sometimes they'll start to sexually be a little bit more aggressive. And so what are we going to do in these situations? Well, we have to monitor, th monitor them and we have to make sure that we're not misleading people and we have to give them guidelines to redirect them. Now, here's a perfect example of it. I had a gentleman in my building, and his name was Larry. And Larry was kind of a handsome guy. He was a financial planner and uh, a very savvy, savvy type-like person. And he was a little bit overweight, and he uh, looked like old King Cole, and he had a very nice beard that was trimmed up so nicely all the time. And he was fun and he could tell jokes and he would interact with people and he was just a lot of fun to be around him. And I started to notice as I'm doing my rounds, 
every once in a while, he'd come up to certain women and say, honey, give me a good morning hug. And they would give him a hug. However, when they gave him that hug, it was front to front. It wasn't the safe hug where we're supposed to give somebody a hug side to side. And I mentioned it to the gals on the floor, hey, you know, this is not really appropriate for Larry to be doing with you. And, oh, Larry's so nice. He's, he's such a gentleman. He's not going to bother us. You're just being silly, Connie. So I said, all right, well, I'm warning you, and as a, a manager on the floor, but also as a frontline person, uh, we want to be careful that we're not misleading Larry. Okay. All right, Connie. All right, go on. We go on about our business. And I notice a month later, not only is Larry asking for a hug now, but when he gives them a hug, he gives them a little rub and a squeeze. And so again, I thought, oh, this is going to become an issue that we should not have to encourage that we're doing something wrong here. Let's fix the problem. So I go up to the group, and as Larry's giving them a hug, I say to Larry, Larry, how come you don't want a hug from me? And Larry, very bluntly and correctly, but not diplomatically, I might add, answers, well, honey, you got nothing to hug. First of all, I didn't really particularly like that, but I know it's true, it's a reality I live with, so I can cope with it. Well, I said, well, that, that, that's, uh, I, I don't think that's really appropriate for you to be doing that to the girls. And I don't think the girls should be hugging you that, so I, I would discourage you guys from doing that. It's gonna lead to some concerns. You're passing some protocol lines that we shouldn't be crossing over. And they kind of dismissed me, and it kind of went away, and and they stopped it for a little while, but then it started again. And then about three weeks later, one of the ladies is giving care for Larry, and she has to reach over the bed, and he reaches up and he grabs her. And she got really upset about it, and she reported it. And well, okay, those things all need to happen. Those things need to be, certainly need to be reported and reported right away. And I was concerned about what was happening to my staff, and I also was concerned about what was happening to Larry. Because now Larry was being blamed for this action. And from an ethical standpoint, I couldn't let that go. And so I had reported then to my administrator, these are the activities that happened before this. And I always make little reports, so I call them my ABC reports, antecedent behavior and consequences. And I note things, and I, I didn't really want to put this in the, in the record right away because it was in the beginning very harmless, but now it had reached the point where it wasn't harmless. Larry was now being blamed, uh, the incident occurred, it shouldn't have occurred, but Larry also had been encouraged by the previous behavior of the last eight weeks or more. So I reported that to my administrator, and of course everybody dealt with it, and uh, it was confirmed to Larry that that was not appropriate behavior, and it was also confirmed to our staff that that was not be, uh, appropriate behavior. So those are important things to kind of remember, because you know, uh, we can have fun with our residents and do a little bit of the boy-girl interaction, teasing, but we have to keep it appropriate so that we're not misleading people or causing them harm or pain. So those are incidents that we need to be careful of and a sexual uh, crossing the line always needs to be reported and uh, dealt with. Now there are other times though when sometimes people just want to have a nice platonic relationship and that's part of the normal part of being a human being because we're sexual beings and more social beings and those things will happen and you want to set up so that your people are safe but you want to also have another incident that I'd like to share with you and that is you want to make sure that both people are aware of what's happening to them and I had a gentleman one time who liked to put on the clothing protectors around people and he'd go around and help people but then I also noticed that on some of the times when he was helping people at first he was just patting their shoulders and giving them a squeeze on their shoulders. But then I noticed sometimes these 
touching areas were going lower around the chest and he rubbed somebody really hard on the chest and so we had to then remind him that that was not appropriate. He was fine with it, wasn't quite aware that he was doing it and it redirected itself and became fine. So those things do happen and we want to protect our people and we want to be aware of why they may be happening so that um, equal responsibility is given to the parties, all parties involved. The other incident that I'd like to share with you, and that is sometimes we have married couples that do want to be together and they want to sleep together. And if that happens and they're agreeable to that, then we want to make sure that their beds are secured and they're close together with seat clamps underneath so that, that if they want to lay in bed and hold each other's hand or talk at night quietly to each other, these are all normal, wonderful things. Or, you know, they're consulting adu consenting adults, and so that's okay too for them to enjoy in the passion that they had when they were younger. We're just, we're just because we got old, we didn't, we didn't lose that passion and a lot of us still have it and want to enjoy it. So when that can be care planned, that should be care planned. The one thing that we have to be careful about though is sometimes as one partner becomes cognitively disabled, we want to make sure that that is still what they want. And so that's important to, to safeguard them in that manner. So having said that, the only other thing that we have less to talk about is when people want to have sexual relationships and they are not married to each other. Or in this particular incident that I'm gonna share with you, it is um, happened in my Alzheimer's unit. And I went to this meeting about, oh, um, ethics and medicine and um, sexual relationships. And we went through that whole thing. I thought, oh my goodness, I'm in an Alzheimer's unit. I'm never going to be using this. For heaven's sakes, these people aren't, this isn't going to happen. And lo and behold, about two weeks later, an incident started to occur where I needed this information of a, how do you make sure that it is safe for certain people to get together? and enjoy each other sexually. And when is it not appropriate? And how do you set it up so it stays safe? And all these incidents that happen with this. So let me share this with you so that you are well aware. What happens is that when two people decide that they want to get together, we got to make sure that they both are agreeable to it, that it can happen in a safe manner. And as long as that relationship goes on, we have to have it approved. So here's my situation that happened to me. I had this lovely young lady by the name of Esther come into my Alzheimer's unit. And Lester was a lovely lady. She was definitely the beautiful trophy wife. And she had clothes and she got dressed up every morning and came down for dinner and for, for lunch and she always looked nice and she Boy, she just had an essence about her that was very attractive. And she'd come in and she'd come into the dining room and she'd look around and decide where she was going to sit down. And then she'd get up and she'd walk over and sit down next to somebody and say hello and be very friendly. And then I started to notice she was doing the same thing when she came into the lobby. She'd come in and she'd look around, decide where she was going to sit down. She'd go sit down next to some gentleman, and my goodness, Esther would just sit next to him, and he would like smile or put his head down or, or turn red, and he was like very, very interested and pleased that this lady had come to sit down next to him, and, but he didn't know quite what to do about it. In other words, what I'm trying to tell you, Esther would walk in the room, and she created a lot more sensory stim and a lot more excitement than I had done in months in that room. She just had that panace about her and people enjoyed being around her and she was just interested in all kinds of people. And I started to notice she would put her hand on their, on their knee or touch their shoulder and they would smile but they didn't know quite where she was going and what was going on here. So it worked out just fine and the, the unit is running just fine. And then all of a sudden, Bill moves into our unit. Now Bill was a retired Navy officer. And Bill knew what Esther was looking for. And they clicked off right away. 
they became guest, best friends and they're running around the building doing things, laughing together, having lunch together. And so we're kind of watching, okay, this is fine. It's nothing going on right here that's, that's, that's bad or anything. They're enjoying themselves. And, and then we start to notice, oh my goodness, they're starting to go into the linen closet. And we're hearing a lot of giggling coming out behind that door. Or we'll find them in a the bathroom, or we'll find them in somebody else's room with the door shut. And now I have to tell you, Esther and Bill are married to some very nice people. And so the first thing that we had to do to make sure that this was gonna be okay and safe and acceptable was we had to call up the POAs, which, was, which were their spouses. So we call up Bill's wife, Betty. And Betty says to us, well, that's okay. He's been in the Navy, I'm, and I'm not criticizing the Navy, but he'll tell you, he's had a woman in every port. And I've known this, and it's been okay, and he doesn't really recognize me that much, but if that's making him happy, I'm gonna approve that. That's okay, he can, he can, he can have a sexual relationship or, or socially flirt or, or get involved with this lady if he wants. So we say, okay. So now we call up Esther's spouse. And Jonathan says, well, you know she's an attractive lady. And you know she's, she's just very social. And she doesn't recognize me. And, and for heaven's sakes, if that's making her happy, let her go ahead and do that. So, okay, we've got permission from both of the POAs so that we've got to set it up that they can have that. We've got a care plan. So we've got to care plan it safely. One thing I'm very glad about, when you write a care plan, the care plan that they do is it's something that they're going to do. And the approaches are something that we do to help them be safe and, and, uh, and, and, and enjoy it and successful. So we proceed to write the care plan. However, their kids were not happy about this and they were very, very upset. But them not being the POA and the fact that we had two aware people that knew what they were doing and enjoyed what they were doing, we then had to give them their resident right to do that. So we set it up so it's safe and we set up some safeguards like they would not behind a locked door. Um, we would make sure that we had somebody available to come in and, and monitor if things didn't get uncomfortable or if one person got unhappy with the other person or there were sounds that were not pleasant or sounds that were, were dangerous. So we did all that and for the most part they probably didn't do any, any more things than, than petting above the, the waist and, and those types of things. So they had a nice relationship and a great romance. And this romance lasted for approximately about nine months. And then I noticed one day when I'm coming into the dining room, usually Esther and Bill would have their coffee morning, their morning coffee together and read the paper. And you'd see them walking up and down the hall, holding hands or going out in the garden, picking flowers and talking and giggling. And so we knew that things were going pretty well. But one morning, the room seemed really very tense. I thought, well, that's unusual now, isn't it? And then about two days later, I come into the room and it's very tense. And Bill and Esther are sitting at their little coffee table together, and they are not smiling, and they're kind of like shaking their paper when they're reading the paper, or they're putting down their coffee cups kind of firmly, let's put it that way. And all of a sudden, Esther looks at Bill. She puts down her newspaper, and she says, and if you ever spend $10,000 on all this stuff that you bought, that you bought, I'm gonna kill you, Bill. And I had just decorated for Christmas, so I had a lot of decorations up. And he looks at her, and he throws his paper down, and he says, no woman ever talks to me like that. I've had a woman in every port, and I'm getting off this ship, lady. And she, he gets up, and he walks away, and she gets up, and she runs after him. Bill, Bill, you come back here. You can't talk to me like that. Needless to say, the romance was over with. And poor Bill, he couldn't figure out how to get out of that unit, or shall we say, off the ship. 
and he would be hiding in closets. We'd find him in other people's rooms, hiding behind their curtains. We'd find him out in the garden because Esther was chasing him all over the place. So we called up Betty and we said, hey, this isn't working so well. We're going to move Bill out to the other unit. And as soon as we can, we're going to find him a, a room in one of our sister facilities on a different campus which means that was the end of Esther and Bill's relationship. However, the important thing is they did have a good relationship for several months and they did enjoy the activity and it was planned safely by calling the POAs and making sure that they were safe when they were, were engaged in that goal and also that um, that sounds were pleasant and they were both agreeable to it. Once they were both not agreeable to it, it was no longer an activity that they could do and we had to change the goal. So we protected Bill from Esther and Esther went on to the next person. And sometimes that happens in, in their roma in romances as, as we know, but you should be able to, to plan um, these activities or these sexual encounters for people as long as you set up for the POA remember to keep it safe and make sure that it's agreeable by both parties all right so that's our little talk about sexual relations for seniors and I hope that this has been helpful in case you come into some of these situations you will know how to handle them all right thank you for looking at activity director the best you can be and we'll see you next time Bye now.